Well, I had two mixed ones that grew in Pathfinder. Okay. And after the fact, we backtracked it, and it was a girl that was coming in and changing my destiny. She wasn't using Sarah's destiny. Can you get one on the inside too? Well, the cave here. On the inside of the ta uh, tabernacle? The cave is inside. It is the inside. The no, it's not. That's just around the outside. Because right there is the brazen altar, and right there is the lever. Those are the only two pieces on the outside. What? Huh? Yeah. I really like the picture now. I think I'm going to need a picture of the Jerusalem. You guys did this video about the the lost Jews in Siberia. Yeah, they had they had uh, a couple of them that I saw um, that were um, oh, like virtual. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was really kind of cool. They never make their mind up, do they? Oh, hey, can you go in and get me a pair of glasses? I know I forgot something. I better have some on, otherwise I can't hear, I can't see. Um, bring me a water. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Hmm? If you look at the bulletin, it's in there. I've got it done. And I've got it on my announcements. So, oh, man. Yeah, we're up to chapter 27. Genesis, or Exodus chapter 27 today. 
Okay, I know I knew where I saw that. Um, that um, of the of the tabernacle. You know where it was? In that prophecy watch. That's where it was. Uh, they had the tabernacle prophecy in there. I knew I'd seen it somewhere, and I couldn't figure out where it was. But that's where it was, because when you gave that to me, I saw it, and I thought, oh, man, this is going perfect with, with Exodus, and then I could never find it again. Here it was underneath my pulpit. Yeah, there's a big thousand of them. Oh, I know. So, all right, let's start with a word of prayer, and we're going to get started with Exodus chapter 7. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for all you've done for us. I just pray now that you'll guide and direct in all that we do today. Pray might get something out of this that we can use in our own lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Exodus chapter 27. All right. We're going to be looking today at the last two, actually last three of the things that will be made for the temple. Uh, this is all in the outer court, and um, uh, we have went through pretty much the inner inner court um, in there. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at at the last two pieces of furniture or last two things for the outer court and also the outer uh, wall um, or the outer curtain of the uh, tabernacle. But starting in verse 20, in chapter 27, verse 1, it says, And thou shalt make an altar of smitten wood, five cubits long, five cubits broad, and the altar shall be four score, and the height thereof uh, be three cubits. And thou shalt make the uh, horns upon the four corners thereof. The horns shall be of, of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Now, uh, what we need to realize here is that uh, God wanted Moses to make an altar um, of brass on the out, uh, out in the outer court of the, um, um, of the tabernacle. We're going to be looking at this in depth uh, here in a minute or two, and I'm going to go through the whole um, tabernacle uh, after we get through the lesson here, and I'm going to show you where all of this stuff was, and, it, and God had, had uh, told Moses that it had to be in a specific order in a specific place, and uh, it's very interesting. You know, God is a God of order, and uh, everything that he wants done, he wants it done um, in the fashion that he wants it, and uh, everything has to be done decently and in order. So we're going to see that here in just a little bit. But uh, he says, make an altar uh, in verses uh, 1 and 2. Uh, this altar was to be made of, um, of smitten wood, and it was to be overlaid with brass. Now, if you remember the altars that were made before, what were they overlaid with? Gold, pure gold. They were to be uh, made, and they would be overlaid with pure gold. Now, here we see that uh, it's going to be overlaid with brass. And um, um, I find this very interesting, the size of this. It was going to be seven and a half feet square. I mean, it's going to be seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide. And then it's going to be um, uh, four and a half feet high. Now, um, I found something very interesting about the measurement of this because um, it says in there um, that the height of it was going to be three cubits. Now, what is? who can tell me what the height of a man is? Huh? Four cubits. Four cubits. 18 inches. Okay, so you look at 18 times 4, that would be about the height of a man, or 70 inches, roughly. All right, now, if you take and you think about it, God said, I want this three cubits high. Why was it he wanted it three cubits high and not four? What's that? Well, not only see the top of it, can you imagine putting an animal into something and you have to pick it up over your head to put it in there? You know, this here is going to be 18 inches shorter than you are, and you can just kind of just put it in there. And um, uh, so here we see that, that God wanted it three cubits high, or he only wanted it four and a half feet high. Um, and now there was to be four rings put in the four corners of the um, altar. What were the four rings for? 
right, to take and carry it. Now, the interesting thing about these uh, staves that they're going to put in there, they were to be overlaid with brass. Now, what were the other ones overlaid with? Pure gold. And here we see that these were overlaid with brass, and uh, so they, uh, um, they were going to have to be very durable. I mean, this thing had to weigh a ton of man. I mean, think of the weight that this had to be. It's eight, almost eight foot square. It's uh, four foot, four and a half, almost five foot high. And it's, it's solid brass. I mean, that thing had to be heavy. And uh, so um, here we see that um, uh, the, the four rings were in there to take and carry it. Um, then there was also four horns placed around the top of it on each corner. Um, now, this altar was uh, not going to be beautiful in any way, shape, or form like the uh, ones inside the uh, tabernacle were, uh, but it was to be used for a specific purpose. And uh, we're going to be looking at that here in just a minute. But then in verse 3, it says, uh, Thou shalt make, um, make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and uh, his fish hook or flesh hook and his uh, fire pans, all the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass. Now, the parts of this, uh, believe it or not, there's a lot of controversy in, in different uh, uh, commentaries and stuff over the, the uh, reason for all of this. But the pans, uh, they were to be placed underneath the altar. Um, they, were, they were to go underneath the altar, and they were to take and uh, um, collect all of the ashes that would drop down through the altar. Now, how many of you have ever had a wood burner stove? Or a coal burner, or something like that. Well, most of us. What happens after the wood burns? It goes down into the ash pan, doesn't it? Well, basically, that's what these were. Were ash pans, and they would collect the bones. They would collect the uh, anything that would fall down through there. These pans would collect. Now, um, then um, it goes on to say that um, um, shovels. And these were to remove the ashes from the uh, pans, and they were to uh, help to clean the debris from the altar, uh, you know, which had burned on and things like that inside the altar uh, uh, before they moved it. Uh, then you had basins. These were to catch the uh, blood uh, from the animals uh, when they were first killed. And what they would do with that blood is they would take and they would sprinkle it on the person who brought the sacrifice. And that was for an atonement or to, um, uh, for the sins of that person. Uh, then you had your uh, uh, flesh hooks. Now, um, these were used by the priest, uh, and they, they served in, in the altar itself. It was used for two purposes. Number one, the, um, the priest would take and uh, go down in there with that flesh hook. There was three tines on it. And it would go down and stir it up, so to speak. Now, think about this for a minute. You've got a fire burning. You put an animal on top of that. And you put another animal and another animal and another animal on top of that. What's going to happen? They're not going to burn, are they? They're just going to, you know, smol uh, smolder. So what they do with that flesh hook is they would pull it apart so that the flames would come up and it would burn the sacrifices completely. Now, the fl flesh hook, as we're going to see later on, uh, was also used for something different in the temple worship. And what that was is the, uh, the high priest would boil uh, the sacrifices, or they would boil, and the high priest would take that flesh hook. It was only supposed to have one tine on it. And he would take that, and he'd go down through, and whatever he came up with, that's what he got to eat. Now, if you remember Sam, um, Eli and Eli's sons, they made one with four tines on it so that it was just like a pitchfork, and they'd go down in there with that, and they came out with a whole bunch of stuff to eat, and that's why they were so fat. You know, they, uh, they were a little overweight and, uh, and things like that. But here we see this flesh hook was used for a little different purpose than what that was in that uh, this would stir up the pot, so to speak, 
and it would cause the, um, um, the sacrifices to burn better. Then you have your fire pans. Now, I found these very interesting. A fire pan. What would you think a fire pan was? Anybody else? What would a fire pan be used for? Huh? Okay. The fire pan, what that was used for was to take coals from that fire. They would put them in these fire pans. And as the tabernacle moved from place to place, they would have these hot embers in these fire pans and they would move it to the next location. But the fire was never supposed to go out, right? Exactly. The fire, why wasn't the fire to go out? God is the one who started the fire. When the first sacrifices were done, there was fire that came down from heaven, and it started the sacrifice, sacrificial fire. And that fire was never to go out. And so what they would do is they would uh, take these hot embers, and they would put them into a fire pan, and they would carry those hot embers from point A to point B, and then they would start their fires back up again. Now, there was something else that that was used for. And you remember in the, um, uh, the holy place, there was the altar of incense? Okay, the altar of incense, this fire was also used for that. They would take the coals from that fire, and they would start the uh, um, altar of incense in the holy, uh, in the holy place. And uh, that would start their, their fire of incense in there, so that they had a fire to burn the incense and things. And so um, you know, all of this was done and pre-planned by God so that everything was done decently and in order. Now, not only that, but there was a great um, of a network of brass. Look at verse 4 to 8. It says, And thou shalt make for it a grate of network of brass, and upon the net uh, shalt thou make four brazen rings for the four corners thereof, and thou shalt put it under the uh, compass of the altar, beneath um, that the net uh, may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves for the altar, staves of smitten wood, and overlay them with brass. Uh, and the staves shall be put into the rings, and the staves shall uh, be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Uh, hollow the uh, boards shall thou make it, uh, as it was showed to thee in the mount, so shall ye make it. Now, what we need to realize is this, is that there was going to be a, um, a net, or it's going to be a brass, um, I don't know how to explain it. Huh? Oh, string, string? Yeah, a brass grate that were going to be in the inside of this altar. And now there's going to be four chains that are going to come up the sides of the altar, and they're going to hook that were inside the altar that were being burned. It would either be closer to the fire or it would be farther away from the fire, depending on how many sacrifices they had and you know how fast they wanted it to burn and things like that. And so that's what that was used for. What this grate then went up and down. And then anything that fell through this grate went into the, um, the, the pans underneath. And uh, then they had to take and be be removed from there. Um, you know, God had pre-planned this so well that everything that he told uh, Moses to do was going to be done exactly that way. After all, he says, as I showed you in the mount. Now, to me, I'm thinking to myself, what did God show Moses in the mount? You know, how did he show this to Moses in the mount? Did he have a big screen up there and say, okay, Moses, this is what it's going to look like? You think he did that? I think he made a picture in his head. I do too. I think he, he visually uh, showed uh, Moses in his mind what all of this was supposed to look like. Now, um, I can remember, you know, growing up, my dad had plans made for the new grocery store. And uh, we'd lay these blueprints out, and I could envision in my mind what that was going to look like before it was ever built. 
And I believe that that's what happened with Moses, is God gave him the plans to build all of this, and he put in his mind exactly what not needed to be, be done. You know, there, there was a lot of different, um, uh, there's a lot of different ideas in, in what each of these things were to be used for, but I, I felt that the ones that we uh, used here were probably the best uh, that we could take and, and uh, use for that. Now, um, if you take a look at the uh, outer part of the uh, tabernacle, if you start in verse 9, it says, And thou shalt make a court of the tabernacle for the south side uh, southward, and there shall be hangings in the court, fine twine uh, linen uh, of a hundred cubits long for one side, uh, and uh, twenty uh, pillars thereof, uh, and their uh, twenty sprockets uh, shall be of brass, and the hooks and the pillars and their fillets uh, shall be of, of silver. And likewise on the north side, the length thereof shall be um, hangings and of a hundred cubits long and 20 pillars, and there are uh, 20 sprockets of brass, and so on. And so if, if you look at the breadth of it, uh, it was going to be uh, 50 cubits. Uh, it's going to be half as wide as it is long. So uh, as I was going down through this, I got to looking at that, and uh, it was going to be 150 feet long, and it was going to be 75 feet wide. Uh, so that's a pretty good size area. 150 feet long and 75 feet wide, and but it was going to be seven and a half feet high. Now, um, if you take any look at the the height of it, the height was going to be lower than the curtain around the tabernacle on the inside. Why was it God wanted the outer curtain to be shorter? than the one on the tabernacle. Anybody have an idea? Huh? Nope. Okay. Uh, what, what it was for is this. It didn't matter where you were camped in the children of Israel. If you looked towards the tabernacle, you could see the out, outside, but you could also see where the presence of God was going to be. You could see the tabernacle itself on the inside because the curtains were shorter than the ones were on the outside, and they could look and they could see exactly where the curtains were going to be on that. Now, we need to realize that um, uh, with that, um, um, you think it's hot in here? Oh, 73, yeah. Um, but anyway, so here we see that uh, God wanted it shorter so that they could actually see um, you know, the glory of God all the time. Now, the walls um, were to be made of fine linen, and the pillars um, were to be on each side. Now, there's something different about the hanging of this as to what the hanging of the ones on the actual tabernacle were. Did you notice the difference? What was the difference? The hanging or the sprockets of the, uh, of the uh, uh, tabernacle itself were made out of pure gold. And these were made out of brass. So, um, you know, there was a big difference there in what was actually in the tabernacle and also uh, of that. Now, um, there was also a lever or um, a wash basin that was made uh, right before... They would go into the um, the holy place, and we'll look at that when we when we look at the uh, picture of the uh, tabernacle here in just a minute. But um, and what that was used for was for the high priest to wash their feet and their hands before they could go into the holy place, not the holy of holies, because the only one that could go into the holy of holies was the high priest once a year. But what did they have to go into the holy place for? Huh? Nope. Mm -mm. They had to go into the holy place for what? For what? Okay, they had to clean the candles. What else? What did they have to put in there once a week? Yeah, 
New unleavened bread. They had to put in 12 loaves of bread on the Sabbath day one time a week. And they would go in on uh, the early in the morning on the Sabbath day and have uh, 12 fresh loaves of bread, uh, unleavened bread, and they were to be placed there, and the other 12 were to be taken out. And what happened to the 12 loaves that were taken out? They were eaten by the priests. What's that? No. As far as what? Oh, as far as this here? No. Well, you got to understand that, that the tabernacle itself, the tabernacle itself was um, destroyed by the, um, the original tabernacle was destroyed by the Philistines back in the days of Samuel. Well, okay, the thing, there is stuff left over, yes. Okay, the candlesticks are still left over. The beaten uh, work for that. They found that. They have that. And all of that is ready to go into the new uh, temple, believe it or not. Uh, all of that stuff is ready to go and be placed in the third temple. Uh, that stuff, uh, they've got a lot of things that they have found over the years that were uh, used in the tabernacle and in the temple worship that they have all put away and uh, they're ready to be uh, put into the third temple when the third temple is built. So, yeah, there is some of that stuff left. But, I mean, like the Ark of the Covenant and stuff like that, uh, no, they, they'll never find that. And because I, I don't believe it's here on earth. I believe that, that God has it in heaven. But anyway, that's another story. So anyway, he, uh, if you take any look uh, down at verse 20, it says, um, um, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure oil, olive beaten for uh, the light, and cause the lamp to burn always. Now, um, I don't know exactly what the flashpoint is of olive oil, but I know that the pure that you get olive oil, the lower the flashpoint comes down, and uh, uh, it will light almost, you know, like um, fuel oil or something like that, if it's pure enough. Now, the thing that I found interesting was this. Where were they going to come up with the uh, olives? They don't have any olive orchards. You know, there is no olive orchards out in the wilderness. Huh? Well, I, the way I look at it, I'm thinking along these lines, there is wild olives that grow in the wilderness. It's just like uh, if you go out here in the desert, you can find, believe it or not, an apple tree out in the middle of the desert. There are wild apples that grow out in the middle of the desert. Yeah, well, you know, I don't know how much it would take, but they were commanded to find olives, beat out the olives to where they had pure olive oil, and they had enough of it to keep those lamps lit all of the time. Now, um, what's that? Well, I mean, but how much did each, how much did it take? I don't know. How long would it burn? I don't know, you know. So, anyway, then... Um, um, but now, the thing I found interesting was this. Look at verse 21. In the tabernacle of the congregation without the, wall, the veil, uh, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his son shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord, and it shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of the children of Israel. Now, what is that talking about? Anybody have any idea? I found this very interesting. Um, they were to light those lamps at night. And they were to burn all night. And it was Aaron and, their, and his son's job to make sure that those lamps didn't go out. And if they went out, they had to immediately be relit. Now, can you imagine sitting there all night watching lamps? You know what I mean? Do you think you get a little tired? You know, but it was their job from then forever to make sure those lamps didn't go out. 
and you had to make sure there was enough oil in them all the time to burn all night long. Yeah, they had to make sure that they had um, enough of everything there to, um, to do that. And uh, so, all right, you got that? Let's put it up on the screen. All right, if you're taking a look at the, um, on this here, I um, wish I had a pointer. Anyway, the, the, the big building there is, which one are you on? Uh, this one? All right. This one here, if you're taking a look at the, the big building, you see the smoke coming up. That's the mercy seat, and that's the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And then if you uh, go a little bit uh, farther in there, you'll see the, um, the table of showbread with the 12 loaves of bread on it. Right across from that is the uh, candles that were beat out of um, um, one solid piece of gold. Uh, then you have the, um, um, if you come outside of the Holy of Holies, uh, there's the lever right there where the priests had to take and wash themselves before they would go in. And then the, the big thing with the smoke coming up there is the uh, altar of sacrifice or the altar that we just talked about. Now, each of these things were, had to be specifically put in a specific area in the tabernacle. Uh, the, um, the, the candles had to be on, on the one side across the room from the, um, um, the table of showbread. Um, the, um, the outside, everything had to be done in a specific order uh, so that everything was done decently in order for the Lord. Now, uh, the thing I find so interesting is there was nothing in the Holy of Holies other than the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. That's it. But if you come out into the holy place, you've got the table of showbread, you've got the candles, and um, um, there's one other thing in there. I can't remember what it is. Anyway, there was three things that were put in there that were all beaten out of one. Yeah, the, the, that's it, the table of incense. They were beat out of one chunk of gold. Think about that. Now, all of those candles, there, there was uh, uh, seven candles on there, and that, that candelabra was built, beat out of one piece of gold. The, uh, um, the table of incense, the, uh, all of the uh, uh, things that were used there, they were all beat out of one piece of gold. I mean, the, the, the way the craftsmanship and stuff had to be done there was unbelievable. But if you look at the curtains on the outside of it, they are not anywhere near as beautiful as the curtains around the holy, uh, the holy place and around the tabernacle and also in the entrance. Now, um, there was to be two pillars uh, made for the entrance into the, um, into the uh, courtyard of the tabernacle. Now, there was only one way in. There's only one way to get into the into the tabernacle. And I found that very interesting. There is no fire escape. You know what I mean? There was only one way in. And, and you know, it reminded me that there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we need to realize is that God all the way back in Moses' time was showing that there's only going to be one way, one way to get to him. And that's through the Lord Jesus. And if you take and you look at the uh, uh, sacrifices and everything that they made, they didn't save them. They rolled their transgressions and their iniquities over for one year until he went back in the following year and redid it again. And, uh, um, you know, God, everything that he did back in the days of Moses was to show what was going to happen in the future uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. And, but they could not see that because they had no idea of what was going to happen. Now, next week, uh, we're going to take and be looking at the priest garment. And uh, it's going to be very interesting. So you want to be here for that. And uh, um, so it'll be... It'll be good. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for this lesson. I pray now that you'll be at the church service, that everything done be for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
All right, we're going to start church in about 10 minutes. Did you see that box, Dana?